Phil Fairman, Wendy, Wendy Sweet. Sweet here. Thank you so much for plugging into our show this week. Mm -hmm. So, in a previous episode, we had discussed tax advantage ways to invest in real That's estate. Right. So, most of what we were talking about was self directed IRAs, mm -hmm. solo 401ks, Roth accounts. We were also mentioned some Coverdale. Mm -hmm. What's the other one? Insurance, savings, health insurance, health uh, yes. plans. Yes, HSA. Uh, yeah, savings plans. Mm -hmm. But there was one more that I wanted to cover, and it's called a whole life policy, and it's not very many people know about this. Well, that, I want to say something really quick before you go into this, because when I remember when Bill first brought up this whole life policy thing to me, and you might have the same opinion that I had in the beginning, which was everybody knows that life insurance doesn't work if there's a scam out there there's it, it's you know term is the only way to go and you're putting money in a pit and and after talking to our next guest i mean he, he, he totally changed my opinion because they've got a really good way to work it right well yeah and, and most money managers will tell you that insurance policies are for insurance right and not investing savings right for retirement or for financial planners and the stock market and, and real estate because most insurance companies are investing conservatively and you're not going to get that return. Right. And for what you're, you're just better off taking that extra that you'd pay for the premium for the whole life that's going towards the savings and invest that in the stock market. You'd be better off, but they don't tell you about, the added benefits to this. Mm -hmm. And there's only a few companies out there nationwide that will do the type of whole life policy. That's right. And that we're, we're in with about. one. And you can actually add to <laughs> the cash value. That's right. And the other thing was it takes you a long time to get the cash right. value. Well, let's let Chris talk. Anyway, <laughs> without further ado, I do, we do. <laughs> our friend uh, Chris Miles, he, he is a financial advisor by trade anyway, not to mention, but he doesn't like to admit that, does he? Yeah, he's the anti-financial <laughs> anti, yeah, that's right. And uh, not only that, he's a, a pretty good dancer. Last yes, time he is. We got together for an event. He made everybody in the audience get up and practice some dance. That's steps right. Too. So Chris, thank you so much for joining us, my friend. <laughs> well, thanks for that awesome intro. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, give us a little kind of a, holistic look at the plan that, that we were talking about, the, the whole life policy where you can actually force early cash value on it and kind of like how that works. Because we, we force mm -hmm. appreciation on uh, real estate by, you know, upgrading it, right? So it kind of right. reminds me of that. Yeah. Let me kind of jump in really quick about how I came about to be that way, because I was kind of like Wendy too. I actually was totally against whole life. You know, like I started out 18 years ago as the mainstream financial advisor, you know, did that for four years. But the thing is, and, and this is why it's so crucial what people are listening to with you, what you guys too, with your fund and everything else is that the stock market does not return the way they say it does. You know, mm -hmm. there's average and then there's actual returns, right? And the actual return of the stock market, if you look at the last 30 years, is only seven and a half percent. That's if you put that in the calculator, you would actually get the right number, not 10 or 12. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, cash flow sucks, mm -hmm. right? So <laughs> it's not a good cash flow play, anyways. So when you combine all that together, I realized about 2006 that I was really just a salesman in a suit mm -hmm. and I was selling crap, you know, and it didn't work. <laughs> and, and by me doing the opposite of that advice, by actually investing for cash flow and like the things you guys talk about, I was actually able to retire when nobody else in the financial industry was retiring, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a key thing to understand. That's why I became an anti-financial advisor, right? Later on, because, you know, people, of course, I was like, I'll never teach about money again. I'll never be a financial advisor. And then people are like, yeah, but how'd you do it? Right. And that's kind of what pulled me out by 2007 and such. And, and around that same time, I met a lot of real estate investors and different millionaires. And they're the ones that are saying, hey, whole life is awesome. I'm like, what are you talking about? I was always told that whole life sucks. Like, you get like maybe a one or 2% rate of return. I do better just buying term and investing in the market. That's kind of what I taught before, right? And they're like, no, no, no. It's so much bigger than that. Like, and they're even just talking about like how the death benefit gives you permission to spend money and stuff. But over the years, I started to realize 
wait a minute, if I come from an investor perspective, I want cash now. I want as much cash as possible. I want as little co going to cost as possible. I want leverage, right? I want to do that. And, and that's what I found out is that we're able to create this really tax-free, supercharged savings account, right? You know, same thing that people do when they take money out of their savings and they go and invest it and then they hope to get an income back. So if they go into your guys' fund, it kicks back a, you know, kicks back a return. They get their monthly payment or, or quarterly, right? Dividends or whatever. And then when they get that return, they're like, cool, I just made some cash flow. And they'll put it right back in the savings to try to rebuild that savings back up. But what we do at the life insurance, we do the same thing. And there are some insurance costs, especially in the beginning. But if we can minimize those costs to where most of your money is all going to cash, so you can use this tax-free savings account that earns, you know, at least four or five percent tax-free average returns, right? That's if you do nothing with it. Right. But then you can take that money, you can get a line of credit from the, the like a private line of credit from the insurance company, use that money to invest. You can take that money you get from cash flow, pay it towards the line of credit. And what happens is because you've got all that cash still sitting there, because you didn't deplete the cash by withdrawing all the money out. Now all the cash is in there earning compound tax-free interest. That's growing while you're also getting the cash flow paying that loan back. What happens is almost like when you use a HELOC. It's like a HELOC that actually pays you interest, right? right. And what ends up happening is now you have money growing here tax-free. And because the cash flow coming through, you're still getting the cash flow from the investment. You end up making more money than you would just using a savings account. Just, you know, investing, refilling it, the savings back up, investing again and refilling it back up you create this like really faster version of an income snowball. Hmm. So that gives you an opportunity to do one of two things. You could take the cash flow, the difference between what loan payments are and what you're making in the outside investment. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you can take that as income or some sort of, you know, monthly payments, if you will, or you can actually take all the earnings pay down the line, the payments on the line and take the profits and put it into your cash value policy. That money, obviously there's a, a, a taxable event on that part that you've earned outside of the policy, but you're taking right. those proceeds and you're adding it to your balance and you're allowing that to con continue to compound and grow over time. So you're basically compounding the compounding the compound yeah. is key. Does that make sense? The eighth one yeah. of the world, we say. Right? So if you don't need it as income, you can just continue to add it to your your, your balance there, right? Yeah, you're getting two returns at the same time, right? With the same money, you're making money in two places at the same time, right? And that's basically what's happening. Um, you know, kind of give you an example, like like for example, your fund right now, like is it how often does it pay out? Uh, quarterly. It's quarterly, right? Okay, that's what I thought. So obviously, if you're getting mon monthly quarterly, somebody puts in a hundred grand to your fund, right? They're gonna make you know, about what is that? 1500 bucks a quarter, right? Something like that. Yeah. So, you know, 6,000 a year, you could take that 6,000 a year, put it right back in, you know, and, and pay down towards that line of credit. Here's the cool thing. Unlike a home equity line of credit, right? Where if you were to do that same thing now, before you pay your first quarterly payment, they got to pay a couple monthly payments to the bank. Mm. But if you do it with the life insurance, there are no monthly payments. So you can borrow, you can pay it back however, whenever you want. The, the deadline for paying back the loan is your death. Wow. <laughs> That's the balloon payment, right? I like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it's, yeah, it's very flexible. You can pay it however you want. But the way to make it work where you're talking about where you make money in two places is, hey, if I'm making money over here, it's more than what they're charging me in interest over here. I can then go and start paying back towards this, this line of credit that they have, freeing up the cash to invest again as well. And, uh, and yeah, now you're making more money because that money's in there compounding. So, you know, say it was a hundred grand they put in, say you had 200,000, that policy, you take a hundred grand. If you just withdraw from a, a bank, you lose that ability to earn interest on that hundred grand that you just pulled out. But here, the full 200 grand is still in there. You get the hundred grand kicking off that money that you're putting right back in, building that cash back up again. And you're earning that, that extra return. And so, it's awesome. And, and the nice thing is too, like it's very, it's just the same tax treatment as like a Roth IRA, you know, where you put in after tax dollars, it grows tax free and you can access it tax free. Right. Uh, the difference though, is that unlike a Roth where you're capped to like six, seven grand a year, you can dump in, you know, I have people dump in like over a half million a year, you know, like they can dump in as much as they want and there's no 59 and a half rules. You don't even have to wait till you're 59 and a half to touch the money and get your hand slapped with that stupid penalty. <laughs> like, no, I can, I can access that money right now. Like, I don't have to wait till then. So for any of my clients are saying, 
hey, I want to retire at 50 or whatever it might be or 40 or whatever, right? Well, why would I want to put my money somewhere where they'll say, hey, yeah, you can touch it, but not until you're 60, right? It just doesn't make sense. Here we can get the money, use it, invest with it however we want. There's no restrictions. It doesn't have to be like self-directed. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty flexible in how you use it. Well, another advantage I see automatically as well is there's no rules for prohibited transactions either. Right. Yep. Uh, yeah. the, the IRS prohibits <clears throat> you from investing your self-directed IRA into certain things or with mm -hmm. certain people. Right. And That's right. You and I with, can with this together. policy, <laughs> you can, you know, you can invest that money any way you want, right? Yeah. That's why, that's why I say it's like a tax-free savings account, right? Yeah. Like it's a tax-free savings account that pays you way better. It doesn't earn point nothing percent, but it, it can be used freely however you want. I mean, I had somebody ask me the other day, like, could I just blow it? I, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> laughing at the point nothing. Is, is that not a good return? <laughs> that's right. You make point nothing percent in the bank, you get taxed on point nothing percent. I mean, that's a pretty crappy deal, you know? You know? There's your tax savings right there. That's right. Yeah. You don't earn much. You don't pay anything. Yeah, yeah, I remembered hearing you uh, when you presented it to us at a Freedom Founders event. I, weren't you talking about how it worked for the Rockefellers? Oh, yeah. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, so the Rockefellers, I mean, yeah, there's a guy who wrote a book called Garrett Gunderson, wrote, you know, what would the Rockefellers do, right? It's, right. It's, and that's a guy I actually used to work with years ago. We've, we've taught that forever. Pretty much all it is is, a, is just keeping perpetual money going from generation to generation, right? So that the money never runs dry. So like when you, when you have a trust, you know, the trust is what kind of goes to your heirs, you know, and it dictates how the money gets distributed, right? It's not just, you know, give them all the money and boom, hope you blow it by the time you're dead. It's like, hey, we can direct how we want this money to go to your, your kids and your grandkids and great grandkids and so on. Well, the way to fund it, of course, especially for your estate is using the life insurance, right? The death benefit, not even the cash. Cash is while you're alive when you're investing, right? Then you also get this bonus death benefit that that can pay into that trust. So when you die, it pays in, it funds it, it kind of creates that funded trust. Now, if you have all your kids and grandkids also having in policies as well, they all fund it to the same family trust. Mm. And so what happens, especially if you educate them, it's not just, you can't just give up, set up the structure, right? It's not just about getting a trust and everybody getting life insurance and whenever they die, it pays into it to fund it. It's also got to be education based too. You got to be teaching them, hey, how do I get, you know, how do I actually cr create money? You know, how could I not be a mooch, you know, <laughs> you know not be an entitled trust fund baby, right. you know, that kind of thing. And so you can set up parameter to say, hey, you know what, and before you get access to this, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or do this or do that, you know, and if you t access money from the trust, you got to pay it back with interest. So you got to borrow from it rather than just receive it, right? right. You know, that kind of thing. Like it's your responsibility to take that money and kind of like the parable of the talents in the Bible. It's like it's your responsibility to take it and make more with it, not just bury it and or blow it. You know, right. that would be the fourth servant if that if there was a fourth servant in the parable of the talents, you know. Right. Like there's a guy that just blew it. It's like I got nothing left. Sorry, you know. <laughs> well, you know, you could set up a family office if your if your net worth is high enough mm -hmm. and do the same thing. I know yep. that before they had the benefits for your larger companies back in the day before you had your pension plans, they would take their top executives and they would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They'd get a life insurance policy and that life That's insurance right. policy on those executives went towards the company to provide benefits for the executives. Mm -hmm. And when one yep. passed away, they would replenish it. So back to, you know, being the bank yourself, when, when you have these policies and you can uh, borrow against them, why pay the bank when you can borrow from yourself and pay yourself back with interest and just continue to perpetuate the legacy? Mm -hmm. but, That's right. But you're right. Typically after what, three generations, the fourth one doesn't have any money left because they haven't been trained properly or educated properly on, on how That's to right. keep it going. Mm -hmm. uh, That's exactly it. You're always I'll see what happens to Paris Hilton's kids, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, you're always going to have somebody that's going to be a, I don't want to say worthless, but kind of a sponge off the rest of them. <laughs> but it, at least with a death benefit, when they do die, they put something back in, right? That's true. Even if they blow it all, it can you know, put it right back in. And that's kind of the cool thing about it. If you think about it, like what, how you let, use life insurance, even just think from a death benefit standpoint, which is not usually the thing I, I focus on a lot. But when you think about it from that standpoint, it kind of gives you the permission to blow your money while you're alive. 
right? You can spend down all your assets or build assets. You can do either, right? But uh, I get some people say, you know what? I don't want to leave anything for my kids. Like I, I want to spend down all my assets. Like, well, cool. You can spend it all down. You can even run up a mortgage, even do a reverse mortgage. You get more cash flow that way. And then the death benefit can pay it off, you know, to pay off all your bills you ran up or whatever you want to do, you know, like you can do it however you want, but it's, a, it's kind of fun when you think about how that's way better than people that live today, usually run, thinking they're going to run out of money at some point, right? They're going to think, oh, well, I don't want to live too long because if I do, I'm out of money and I'm, I'm broke living in with my kids again. And I don't want to do that because I don't even like that son, you know, or whatever it might be. You know? <laughs> or his dog. <laughs> or his dog. Yep. <laughs> so that brings up another question. So I love the reverse mortgage piece mm -hmm. for someone, you know, a couple that is downsizing now has mm -hmm. the asset of their home, which is typically your largest asset. And let's assume it's free and clear now. You're going to sell that home and then downsize somewhere else. Well, with a, a reverse purchase money mortgage, yeah, a lot of people don't know those are even available. You could sell that house, take half of the money and use it as a down payment mm -hmm. on a reverse purchase money mortgage and never have a mortgage payment again for the rest of your life. Right. All you have to worry about is taxes, insurance, and homeowners association dues if that's where you choose to live. You take the other half of that money, you could put it into that cash value insurance policy and continue to compound that and then borrow against it and do other investments. Now, that's right. That being said, you have to be 62 years old to qualify for the reverse mortgage. What kind mm -hmm. of age range are we looking at to get an insurance policy and still it being affordable at that age? Yeah. If you're at least average health, you could typically do this even into your early 70s or so. I mean, you can go later, but the numbers get tricky because it depends on cash flow, you know, and, and things of that at that time. Every once in a while, I get people in their 70s and they don't have a whole lot of cash flow. It's like, you know what? We might use a different product. We might use like a universal life because term, they won't even let you get term after age 70, you know? So you might have to get like a universal life that's kind of cheap that just gives you your death benefit and that's it. Mm -hmm. So if we did that, it's like, okay, if we got this lump sum of cash, if it doesn't make sense to do the whole life, well, great. We could do something like a cheap universal life and then invest the difference elsewhere, right? There's always a way you can work it. It just depends. But I mean, the strategy I talk about where you get the double dip on your investment returns and make money twice, that's usually best when you're in that accumulation phase, right? When you're building your assets, trying to build your cash flow, that's when it's perfect. Um, if you're at the point where you're now saying, I'm just trying to consume money at this point, you know, then we might switch it up. We might just say, hey, minimum death benefit. We just need the minimum amount. We don't need to overfund it like what I usually do with my policies where you dump in more cash and that's what goes into that account faster. You know, we might just say, great, simple, easy, invest the rest. Nice. What would a young person do? You know, somebody that's kind of newish, mm -hmm. uh, maybe have a young family. I'm thinking, you know, they don't have a whole lot of money to put in. So, so where would you go from that direction? Yeah, I actually just had somebody like that last night I talked to, you know, he's like 29 years old, got two young kids, one on the way, you know, and he was like, Hey, I think this concept's cool. I want to start investing at some point. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, how much per you know month or year are you trying to save up to do that? And he's like, well, maybe like five, 6,000 bucks that we're trying to put away. We're trying to put away 700 a month to build our savings. I'm like, all right. I'm like, we could do this strategy. And I showed him like a really basic $5,000 a year type policy, you know, and because he's younger and in good health, it's cheaper, right? right? So the younger and healthier you are, the easier it is to not only put in less money and make a better return, but um, you get all kinds of flexibility. So I showed him that, but it didn't quite meet all their needs, what he wanted for insurance. He's like, great, we'll buy some convertible term, you know, so I got him another half million of term as well. And the cool thing is if you get convertible term, you can convert that at any time without having to requalify your health. So like, like, for example, I had a guy that was up in Maine. He was a, he was a healthy doctor, 65 years old. We got a whole life policy for him and we got some term insurance, right? Just to kind of cover that basic death benefit need. And, um, and of course, about a, two years later, he got diagnosed with brain cancer wow. and it was inoperable. So he was doing treatments, flying all over the country and everything. And fortunately, a year and a half later, it was gone. No evidence of it at all, right? So he beat the odds. Problem is, if you try to get insurance, it's impossible because now they're like, oh, what if it comes back? We don't want to insure you. <laughs> right. But wow. the good news is we got that term insurance when he was perfectly healthy. 
So that term insurance now we can convert and it actually, they, they will give him that perfect health. So they'll treat him as if he was in perfect health when we convert that to a whole life policy. So it's a, it's kind of a, kind of a cool thing to do it that way. So yeah, if you're young, I mean, sometimes if you can do it, if, if you're, if you're strapped for cash though, we don't even worry about doing a whole life. We just say, great, let's do a convertible term. When you've got more cash flow or more money, then we start throwing some money in it, you know, so we can get a get better return on it. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, that, that is awesome. Great so story. Are, are you taking individual clients or are you looking for financial advisor insurance, uh, licensed insurance agents as clients? Yeah. I mean, I've already got some guys that I've been training off the site. So really I'm taking on individual clients. Yeah. Just to do the, the life insurance and the right, well, consulting and things like that. Awesome. Go, go ahead and tell us how, uh, how they can get you, you want you. to be contacted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one, I mean, definitely I would invite you guys to follow my podcast, which is called the Chris Miles Money Show. It was a really unique name. It took hours and days coming up with this name, you know, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, check out the Chris Miles Money Show. It's on iTunes, you know, and every, all the other podcast apps and such. Um, and you can also just go to my website, moneyripples.com. And uh, there's some great blogs on there, some good information, even an ebook that I have that is massive 28 pages because I put page breaks in it. <laughs> so uh, it will take you like maybe 20 minutes to read through it all, but it's got awesome tips on ways to actually uh, increase your cash flow to, to, to the tune of like 34,000 a year is the average. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to have all those uh, links in our uh, show notes as well as, uh, you know, on, on any of the videos. And, and that reminds me, by the way, thank you guys so much for joining us. Yes. Uh, please follow us. Please uh, like us, like us, and then tell all we, your friends. We, we have some other shows here that from pertain. other shows that you can get to. I don't know exactly where they are in the screen, so look around it. You'll see some links there. <laughs> and Chris's information as well, uh, right? Chris, you've been awesome. Thank you so much for for joining us. And, it's been a pleasure. It's been a lot of fun, guys. Thanks. Thank um, you. We'll see you guys on the next show. Thanks. So thank you so much for joining us. If you really like what you heard, you want to see some more, switch over here or <laughs> here or perhaps there. There's more episodes, but they're somewhere. Yeah. I think Click they're, it on. They're up. By the way, subscribe and like us as well. Please.